surgeon from the Cleveland Clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. I'm Chris Radcliffe. I'm a spine surgeon from the Rothman Institute. I'm in Egg Harbor, New Jersey. Uh, Alan Hillebrand. I'm a spine surgeon from the Rothman Institute, mostly in Philadelphia. And uh, we're here to talk about uh, the decision making that relates to uh, treating patients with cervical radiculopathy and talking about uh, performing an ACDF or disc replacement uh, or a posterior cervical foraminotomy. And, uh, and in this brief discussion, it might be worth uh, each of us giving a, our, our perspective on who is sort of the, you know, the ideal patient and the fact that I think we we'll all agree that these, these three procedures are not interchangeable, but there are specific types of patients who we might favor one procedure over another. It might be worth discussing that in the time we have today. So I don't know if you want to maybe start, Tom, and talk a little about one of those and where you might find the, the right niche. Yeah, sure. I, I think all... All three procedures are viable options. You know, when we think about the comparative data that exists right now between ACDF and total disc arthroplasty and even cervical foraminotomy, it looks as though the all of them are almost identical. And so, one there, one then there has to um, determine well which patient population is the best. And I think that you know, for a young population, and, and perhaps on the odd duck and spine surgery, because even in my own practice, comparing myself to my partners, when cervical radiculopathy presents itself, even a young patient or even an older patient, you know, my preference is to do a foraminotomy on, on them because we've looked at all of our data and our success rates are the same, our revision rates are the same for ACDF versus posterior cervical foraminotomy. And I will say, though, though, you know, some patients. Um, uh, are good candidates for both an ACDF and uh, for a total disc arthroplasty. And I think a younger patient uh, who has a tall disc um, is, is a potential candidate for a total disc arthroplasty or a foraminotomy. I tend to reserve ACDFs for patients who have a multi level disease or patients who have um, uh, a spondylolisthesis or some dynamic instability that makes me steer away, or even a ky segmental kyphosis. Uh, that would also make me steer away from a posterior cervical frame and anatomy or total disc replacement. I agree. I, I think that the indications for disc replacement are probably the most well defined because there are recent IDE studies. And so uh, currently, I think that disc replacement's available for patients with one or two level of disease, contiguous levels in two cases, in the two level cases, um, with really an absence of severe spondylosis or facet arthropathy. And uh, thus, um, these are people who are generally younger patients who don't have a lot of underlying arthritis and, uh, and, 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 and definitely don't have any instability or even severe disc height collapse more than 50%. Um, I think that, that, that ACDF is certainly a better option in those patients who um, have advanced spondylosis and degeneration. Uh, in the decision between a disc replacement and a foraminotomy, um, I, I really look at the, the patient's uh, uh, the extent of their, their axial neck pain um, and uh, I'm more reluctant to perform a foraminotomy um, in a patient with uh, significant uh, axial neck pain. Um, I'm more likely to do a disc replacement in that patient. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I always look for the patient for the disc replacement who has the taller disc, and we talk about 50%. I think that's reasonable because when you get to be more than 50% loss of height, you're really looking at a spondylotic arthritic level and I would make the argument that trying to put normal motion in a level that's not moving normally may not actually be that good a thing for a person. It may actually cause pain because the facets probably aren't normal either. Um, of course, I think that in my practice, many of the people who have a soft disc herniation are the patients that actually get better with non-operative treatment because those soft discs will resorb over time. On the other hand, for those who don't, sometimes those are actually the ideal patients for the foraminotomy because the posterior foraminotomy especially if you're looking at a level like C6-7 or C7-T1, can often provide actually better access to that foraminal disc herniation, which is what we sometimes see, and the access and ability to decompress at that location is really outstanding, which is really where I personally kind of reserve the foraminotomy for. I don't really do it at higher level, more proximal levels than 6-7 than as a general rule, unless there's some unusual situation. Um, any other thoughts about um, overall uh, your experience longer term with disc replacement and uh, any issues that you found longer term with disc replacement to talk about? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, some of the longer term 
issues that I have come across, and even the literature points out, um, is the risk uh, or the incidence of heterotopic ossification. So one of the proponent, proponent arguments for disc replacement as it, as it came to market is that we were going to preserve uh, the, lo uh, the motion at the treated level, but in some studies and in my experience that hasn't always been the case. And I can't determine which disc is more prone to that, nor does the literature uh, present that data to us in a very clear fashion. So that's something that I, I, I think the jury is still out on in terms of how do we best select patients? Is it the milling of the particular body or the disc space that does it, or is it just a certain propensity of a certain patient to set a patient up for that? So uh, that's something that's a little bit ambiguous to me at this point. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. We did uh, do an analysis um, of the uh, Discover uh, IDE data a couple years ago that was published where we looked at radiographic factors that predicted poor outcome um, from cervical disc replacement, and, and so certainly like extensive preoperative disc disc collapse, um, spondylosis, and, and kind of thickened end plates, and and th there were several other factors that were not specific exclusion criteria for the IDE study, but but are kind of intuitive and, and kind of suggest that a more a patient with more adva advanced preoperative spondylosis or loss of height does not do well. It kind of uh, re reiterates the point that you made earlier. That, um, that perhaps restoring motion at a level that's really collapsed and isn't moving uh, much prior to surgery is not a good idea. Well, I hope that this perspective was helpful to um, those of you listening to this video.